What happened here is horrifying. Why it might have happened will leave you incredulous. She was just a good girl. Tina Meyer of suburban St. Louis is the mother of Megan Meyer, who had lived a challenging childhood. She got bullied in school, and uh, she had uh, big self-esteem issues. She had struggled with depression since she was in the third grade. Megan's mother and father allowed her to set up a MySpace account under their supervision and said their 13-year-old swooned when she got her first affectionate note ever from a boy named Josh Evans. He thought she was really pretty, posted on her comments on her pictures, you know, this is beautiful, your eyes are beautiful. For about a month, Josh sent her instant messages saying things like, lucky me and lucky you, because you're my number one. But Megan's mother and father started getting suspicious, because although the notes were not explicit, their parental instinct told them something wasn't right. I did contact the police department, and I called and went, asked to be transferred to the Cyber Crimes Division to see how can I check to see if this MySpace account is real. Nothing you can do. And then one day... It was a whirlwind. It was Josh saying horrible things to Megan, Megan saying things back to him. Nasty messages from a boy who just a day before meant everything to this lonely girl. One in particular cut deep. The world would be a better off place without you and have a shitty rest of your life. Megan was distraught beyond words. This is the part I'll never forgive myself for because she, um, she was looking for me to help um, calm her down like I normally always did and be there for her. And I was upset with her because I didn't like the language that she was using, and um, I was upset that she didn't listen to me and sign off when I told her to. And um, so I was aggravated with her about that and told her that she knew better. And um, she just said to me, you're supposed to be my mom. You're supposed to be on my side. And she took off running upstairs. It was too quiet for too long in that upstairs bedroom. Tina left, walked upstairs. I didn't really pay much attention to it. Um, and then I just heard a blood-curdling scream. I just saw her hanging from her closet. When she just screamed, I, I was I right to, there. Um, I tried picking her up. I uh, picked, held her, and I yanked the whole closet thing out of the wall, and Tina ran and got a knife so I could cut the uh, belt from around her neck and then started performing CPR. She had tears the entire time running down the side of her face the entire until she passed away. <laughs> Just like, please. Please, Megan. Breathe. Megan was pronounced dead the next day. When Ron Meyer came home from the hospital, he wanted to find Josh Evans, let him know what he had done to his little girl. The first place he tried to look was Josh's MySpace page. It was uh, deleted. The whole Josh Evans no longer existed. A month passed as the Myers struggled with their grief, searching for answers why their daughter went to such extremes and who was the boy who drove her there. Then a neighbor told them something stunning. Josh Evans was actually the creation of a mother who lived on the same block as the Myers. A mother who actually went to Megan's funeral. According to an official police report, that mother acknowledged it. The report saying, in the months leading up to Meyer's daughter's suicide, she instigated and monitored a MySpace account, which was created for the sole purpose of communicating with Meyer's daughter. The Meyers were told the other family wanted to find out from Megan why she was having a dispute with their own 13-year-old daughter. As if, if my daughter would have killed herself with a gun, they loaded the gun for her. We are not reporting the name of that other family to protect the identity of their daughter, but did go to their home to try and get their side of the story. Is anybody home? The woman's father answered the door. In a soft voice, the grandfather said it was sad, but then would not say if he thought the police report was wrong. Have you talked to these people since then? Yes, I have. And what have you said to them? <laughs> Probably things that I can't say on camera. And what have they said back to you? Give it a rest. Give it a rest. Now at this point, if you're waiting to hear what law enforcement is doing in an effort to get Megan and her family some justice, well, you may be waiting forever. County prosecutors, the county sheriff's office, and the FBI 
say there is no indication whatsoever a crime has been committed, so there are no plans to do anything legally. After initially telling us they weren't even investigating the case anymore, the prosecutor is now telling CNN his office will review the situation. But more than a year has gone by since Megan hanged herself. Tina and Ron Meyer, who have separated partly because of the stress, were told by lawyers it was best to stay quiet. But they no longer are. They are angry and feel they owe it to Megan to speak out. Maybe your story could help the welfare of another child. Someday. Absolutely. That's what we hope. Gary Tuckman, CNN, O'Fallon, Missouri. The loss of their teenage daughter to suicide. But there is also anger, online outrage over actions they believe led to her death. The parents of a troubled teen say their daughter was driven to her death in part by internet attacks over MySpace. Attacks led in part not by other teens, but adults. Fox 2's Teresa Woodard is live in O'Fallon tonight with a story any parent will find difficult to hear. Teresa. Well, here's what we know about this story. A teenager who had battled depression for years did take her own life. We know her mom and dad now claim a neighborhood family, dear friends of theirs, are now responsible for that death. We know that there was no law broken, no real crime, but it's all a real tragedy. She was, you know, our baby and, you know, we absolutely miss every single second of her. The smile of a girl about to be 14, about to get her braces off. She thought life was wonderful. Not a girl about to end her life. Megan Meyer had battled depression, had ADD, and was on antidepressants, but a new school, new friends, and a new MySpace page strictly monitored by mom and dad was making life better until. She got this email from this boy named Josh Evans. Josh was cute. Tina Meyer reluctantly let him have access to her daughter's MySpace account. Friends first, then boyfriend, girlfriend. Then Josh got me. Megan gets an email or a message on her MySpace from Josh saying that I don't know if I want to be friends with you any longer because I hear you're not nice to your friends. Over two days, more mean messages from him and other people. Megan felt like she was under attack, even from her mom, who was furious Megan was on MySpace without supervision. Tina came home. Megan ran to her room in 20 minutes and I just got this horrible feeling in my stomach and I just took off running upstairs and opened a door and I found her. Megan hung herself. Weeks later a friend told the Myers Josh Evans never existed. That's the biggest tra tragedy of the whole thing. An adult did it. The Myers say a neighborhood family created Josh to see if Megan would say bad things to him about their own daughter. There is a police report where the neighbors admit it. I believe that it's no different than somebody handing her a loaded gun. How could you do that to somebody, a child? The report filed by that neighbor accuses the Myers of property damage. The Myers admit when they found out they lost their temper, damaged that family's property. They say they are responsible. But who's responsible for Megan? We went to the local authorities, the St. Charles County Police Department, the prosecutor, um, the FBI got involved. So we were hoping and praying that something would come, some justice would come, and we had to keep quiet about it because everybody said keep quiet, keep quiet, keep quiet, and let justice prevail. Well, this is where it's gotten us. Now, the Myers say they were such dear friends with uh, that family down the street that they had even traveled together and that they were well aware of Megan, Megan's battle with depression. Since they can't change their own past, they do want to change the law. They are now lobbying lawmakers, hoping someone would pass some sort of Internet regulation. As Megan's father says, anyone who poses as someone online and does something cruel should face some kind of punishment. In O'Fallon, Missouri, Teresa Woodard, Fox 2 News. Well, do you want to sound off on this story? You can go to myfoxstl.com, click on the news blogs to tell... Parents are now fighting to have that law changed. Tina and Ron Meyer join us now live with more in their story. First of all, thank you both for coming in. I know it's still very painful for the both of you mm -hmm. to relive this tragedy. By the way, just so you know, this happened about a year ago. Megan passed away uh, about a year ago in October. Why now? Why are you coming forward with your story now? Basically, um, after it happened, we certainly didn't find out until the weekend of Thanksgiving. Megan passed away on October 17th. We found out the weekend of Thanksgiving that it was the other people that were involved. 
previous to that, we thought it was children. Our mission was going to be get the, the word out that, you know, bullying, we we're going to try to try to do that. Once we found out it was the family, we then went to an attorney. Um, we were told to keep quiet about it. We were told to the FBI was going to investigate it. So there was a long investigation. After we found out they did the long investigation, the FBI said that they couldn't do anything, the local police couldn't do anything, nobody could do anything. It was just kind of our hearts were broken. I mean, we were just... Well, I, I can only imagine. So there are absolutely no legal recourse. Is that right, Ron? What about uh, civil action against this family? Yeah, criminally, as of right now, there's no recourse. But civil, civil suit, yes, is definitely in order. I mean, we're still currently working with that. So, Have you had any contact with this family? Have they apologized? Huh. They sent a one-page handwritten letter um, after we found out saying that um, they sympathized with us, um, that they, you know, understood our grief, but that the information that they knew was far beyond, the information that we found out was far beyond what they knew. Other than that, So no. was there an apology? Was there an I'm sorry? No, there was never, there's never been, uh, basically ever since the uh, first day that we found out, there's been no contact from them to us. And the day you found out, it was another person who came forward who kind of was in the inner circle of all of this, knew this harassment was going on, and all these people kept it quiet. Describe the day when you found out that it was an adult behind all of this. Uh, I think that's the biggest thing that uh, hurt us the most, was uh, that another parent could do this to a child, a 13-year-old girl. A um, lot of anger, a lot of anger um, from both of us. Now, I understand both of you are working together. We do want to let our viewers know that you are both now estranged, going through a divorce. I can only imagine the stress on your family. But you are working together to get some laws on the books to stop this from happening to other families. What's your next step? How are you going to get it done? Well, um, you know, we've kept quiet for so long, and then all of a sudden this has kind of exploded. Um, my hope is, is that with the exposure that we can start getting, people in the public to start helping us, you know, the next step. I know that Ron's been working with his attorney. Um, I guess he can speak about that. Just to contact uh, the local representatives and the people and the, uh, the politicians in the state of Missouri because there's actually no laws on the books that govern the Internet, per se, for this case. Even I mean, cyber stalking, even harassment, nothing applies? Well, there is. There's cyber stalking, but Megan's case, nothing fits into it. It wasn't sexual in nature. They didn't, they couldn't find the last four hours of what happened on the computer. The FBI couldn't find it. This, the, the Josh Evans MySpace was deleted. So they couldn't fit Megan's case into any specific law. And Tina, I know you were diligent in, in policing her MySpace account. And it's not only MySpace, by the way. There are other sites like Facebook, regular email, kids pass notes in school, things like that. You were diligent. What advice can you give parents uh, to them for other teenagers, uh, those who may be either the target of bullying or, you know, even on these pages that are unsupervised? You know, um, we as parents were so protective of our children. Um, Megan was never allowed to go to the mall. Megan wasn't allowed to, I mean, we, we watched everything with the MySpace. It was kept private. We are the only ones that had the password. Our computers had passwords. Um, we did every single thing that I thought you could possibly do. Um, looking back, the only possible way, that, thing that I could have done is the only people that were allowed on it were people that I knew. That's very hard. And people you trusted. Right. It's very hard when they're at that age, though. They have a friend, and then their friend starts talking to them. Another friend, they say, oh, Mom, you know, mm -hmm. I know this person. That person wants to be added. It, it's very hard to keep control of that. And in all of this, Ron, how do you want Megan to be remembered? Because many of us are just learning about her. Um, she's one of the most caring people in the world. I mean, that's the hard thing about this is... Uh, she would never have done this to anybody else. And sh for her to know, I mean, she passed away without even knowing that she believes it was this Josh Evans that said the things and didn't know it was uh, this mother down the street. Um, 
Megan was a bubbly person, great sense of humor, outgoing. Um, that's how I would like her to be remembered. Just the pictures that you showed. I mean, there's not a picture in our house that doesn't have her smiling. And that's, but yet she hurt bad on the inside. Mm. Well, Ron and Tina, thank you so much for telling your story. We appreciate it. Many parents, myself included, of a teenager, um, it's just touched many of us inside, and we hope you get what you're looking for for other families. Right. Thanks thank for you. coming in. Thank you. We'll be right back. There is a part of Megan Meyer's story you have not yet heard. Megan is the teenager from St. Charles County who committed suicide after being the target of an Internet prank. You know about her death but not about the intense efforts to save her. Fox News' Teresa Woodard is live in St. Charles County tonight to tell us about the heroic efforts to keep Megan alive. Teresa? Yeah, the night that she took her life, one young man tried desperately to save it. He is a neighbor, a dear family friend, and Megan's little sister knocked on his door, panicking. She was screaming, my mom needs you, my mom needs you, Megan's not breathing. The girl he'd known since birth was close to death, and Blaine Buckles knew how to save her. I was a lifeguard for three years, and so I knew what to do. My adrenaline was rushing so much, and my heart was pounding it. I just didn't have time to think. I mean, I just had to do it. He did CPR till paramedics came. When they rushed Megan Meyer to the hospital, her heart was beating. Blaine did breathe some life back into her but it drained the life out of him. I mean, for hours afterwards, I mean, my, my whole body was shaking. I didn't know what to do. I, I mean, I didn't know who to go to, any, anything to do. I mean, I was just lost. The next day, in the hospital, in her parents' arms, Megan died. The next month, Blaine found out what provoked Megan's suicide. Messages on MySpace from her online boyfriend, one saying the world would be better off without you. But that boyfriend was not real. Megan's family says it was a mom down the street posing as a teenage boy to see if Megan would gossip about her daughter. There's some mean people out there. That mom admitted she did it in a police report. Words hurt. I mean, I've said some pretty mean stuff in my life. Just typing, I mean, you don't actually even have to say it. And I, I just never realized how mean it was. There's no way I would do that. I mean, I, I would... I'd call people out if they said something like that. Megan obviously didn't know that this many lives would be touched and affected by her decision, but definitely a lot of lives have been touched, a lot more than I even thought there would be. Megan's suicide was 13 months ago. The revelation about the neighbor's involvement came 12 months ago. Everybody kept quiet, hoping police could build a case. But now that there is no case, they want everyone to realize how much words can hurt. Mandy. Teresa, if all of these people are still living in that same neighborhood, what's it like there now? It's not just the same neighborhood, it is the same street. And as Blaine described it, it is very tense, especially now that the Myers have gone public. I can just imagine. Well, we first brought you this story yesterday, and our email absolutely overflowed with messages from you wanting to know more. This is 13-year-old Megan Meyer, a beautiful girl who struggled with her weight and her depression. And then Megan met a friend on MySpace, a 16-year-old boy named Josh. She was elated until Josh started sending her cruel and disturbing messages, ultimately telling Megan the world would be better off without her. Megan went upstairs into her bedroom and she hanged herself. After they buried Megan, her parents learned there was no Josh. Instead, it was the parents of another girl who Megan knew playing a sick prank on a vulnerable young girl. Joining us now for more is Megan's friend and neighbor, Blaine Buckles. Blaine tried to save Megan's life by performing CPR on her. Blaine, thanks so much for being here with, uh, with us. Uh, uh, I know that this is such a disturbing story. Megan's uh, birthday, she would have turned 15 this month. It's a hard time. We spoke with her mother yesterday. Just, just before we get into the legalities of it, let me ask you, what, when you first learned that Megan uh, was in trouble, who was it who knocked on your door? It was her little sister, Allison. Uh, she came to the door, banging on it, screaming, and my mom went and answered, and she's screaming, um, my mom needs you, my mom needs you, my sister's not breathing. And I was sitting down eating dinner, and well, I heard that, so I ran upstairs and I grabbed my lifeguard rescue pack and just ran down there. And I know you tried to save your friend, and you were able to get her, her heart beating again. 
Um, obviously, ultimately, Megan died, however. Yes, that's correct. She died the uh, next day in the hospital. And Blaine, you, now just so our viewers understand, the people behind this hoax, the fake Josh, were parents of another girl who was once a friend to Megan. We know the names of those cruel neighbors. We are not revealing it because unlike those neighbors, we actually are going to have some compassion for their daughter, a compassion they did not have for Megan Meyer. So we don't want to mention their names, but you know who the family is. Describe your reaction when you found out it was adults, it was parents on your block who were doing this to Megan. Well, not only were they adults, but they live right next door to us. And I was really angry and I was told I couldn't do anything just to keep my mouth shut since they were going to try to go after them legally. So until now, I've had to keep my mouth shut and not say anything. Blaine, have you talked to them or to their daughter about what they did to Megan? No, they've tried to talk to my mom, and I, don't, I act like they don't exist. I don't even look at them. This is Megan's gravesite, just for folks looking at the pictures uh, online. And now we're told, Blaine, by the, by the police, uh, that, and this is in Missouri, that nothing could be done, that there, are, that there are no criminal charges that can be filed. Now, we had a debate yesterday that's still posted on foxnews.com with our lawyers disagreeing with that. But what your reaction to that statement, Blaine, that no criminal charges can be brought here? I was pretty mad, but then again, I guess you can change the laws so it won't happen in the future to other kids with problems like Megan had. So, I mean, if there's any good we can get out of it, I think changing the laws would be the best. Blaine, without giving out the names of the neighbors who did this, what, what are they like? Apparently it was the mother of, of a friend of Megan who was really pushing this. What is she like? Uh, honestly, I didn't talk to her too much, but from what I did, she was real clingy. Uh, you would first meet her and she acted like she was your best friend. And, like, if you had company over and she'd come over, you'd try to, like, nicely say, okay, I have, like, company over, and she just wouldn't leave, wouldn't leave you alone. Yeah, and, and her daughter, has her daughter, that woman's daughter, has she shown any remorse for this whole thing? No, no none of them have shown remorse. I haven't even seen a tear. Wow, this is, um, this is such a disturbing case, Blaine, and I know that you and others are working to have the law changed so that charges can result when someone abuses a girl like this online. We appreciate you being here. Good for you for trying to save your friend, but our condolences on the loss of her. Thank you. Thanks so much, Blaine. Well, Missouri lawmakers may take action now in the wake of this MySpace hoax. That part of this story tomorrow here on America's Newsroom. Plus, all of our reporting on this story is on foxnews.com right now. Just click on the America's Newsroom page and you'll see it all. And just so our, our viewers understand, Bill, the reason these parents, these neighbor parents, did this to Megan Meyer was, according to Megan's mother, who we talked to yesterday, because they wanted to get information from Megan. They thought Megan was talking about their daughter, and so they con concocted this mm. hoax by which they try to gain her confidence and lure information out of her, and then they just turned it to the, to the cruelest of messages to this young, vulnerable girl who had a history of depression, and they knew it. Online bullies pay attention to what people are hearing and how they're reacting. Strong, strong lesson from this story. Yeah. 37 minutes past the hour. Laws are already changing in memory of Megan Meyer. The St. Charles teen committed suicide after being the target of an online prank. But was it just cruel or a crime? Tonight, her hometown promises to pass new regulations on Internet harassment. But the mayor isn't stopping there. Fox 2's Teresa Woodard has been following this story and has new details tonight from Darden Prairie. Teresa? Yeah, the mayor here in Megan's hometown is asking, how is this not a crime? So she's making it one. And she's telling state and federal governments, if you don't think this is a crime, you need to think again. And to have nothing happen, that's just not right. It's just not right. In her city of 7,000, internet harassment is about to be a local crime. $500 fine is the maximum with, with 90 days in jail is the maximum that I could do. It's something. It's something. It's the start of something. But the mayor's not done because Megan Meyer's memory is haunting her. Megan committed suicide after the boy she thought was her online boyfriend posted mean messages on MySpace. 
Now, Megan's family claims a mom down the street created that boyfriend. They say their daughter, who struggled with depression, was preyed on by an adult. An adult? That adult admitted it. In a police report, she says she did create the virtual boyfriend. He was a fake. He never existed. But she faces no charges because there was no crime. So the mayor's making it a crime and telling lawmakers, You all need to look at this. The reality is that this is a way bigger problem than what's happening in the state of Missouri. The lawmakers are listening but are not convinced it will ever be possible for a state to police the Internet. We have to look at what's within our control, what we can fix and what we can't fix. We may be a small city, but I'm here to tell you, if I don't hear some response out of them, that I am going to keep screaming until I get something out of them. Because if I can do it, they certainly can do it. Darden Prairie's Board of Aldermen meet next Wednesday. That's when they're expected to pass this ordinance, making Internet harassment a Class B misdemeanor in this city. That's as much as they could do. They will also pass resolutions encouraging the state and federal governments to take a look at this. No matter what happens, any law that is passed cannot apply to Megan's case. Live in Darden Prairie. A teen commits suicide after being targeted by an online attack. But those who instigated it face no criminal charges for the online outrage. Or could they? Fox 2 brought you this story last night, and since then, outrage from people wanting justice for Megan Myers' family. And now there is a slight chance justice might come. Fox 2's Teresa Woodard has more details and word that prosecutors might, and we stress might, still be able to build a case. Teresa? Yeah, Mandy, we don't want to give anybody any false hope, but the St. Charles County prosecutor is saying, hold on a minute, everybody. He has yet to review this entire case. When he does, he says he's pretty convinced he will agree with everybody that what happened was cruel, not criminal. But he's not ready to say that for sure just yet. I think every parent and a man, husband, father tells himself nobody's ever going to hurt my family. And it happened. The Myers are not just hurt, they are ruined. Megan is gone. Ron and Tina are divorcing. Their daughter took her own life, but they believe there's someone behind it. She did do what she did, but she had help to push her to do that, which is indescribable to me. In a police report, a family down the street admits they were involved. Megan was almost 14. She met Josh Evans on MySpace. They became online friends, but suddenly his messages turned mean. He began posting nasty things about Megan. The worst, according to the Myers, Josh said the world would be better off without you. It was the final message Megan saw. She hung herself. Weeks later, the Myers were told Josh wasn't real. That family down the street, adults, made him up to see if Megan would gossip to him about their daughter. They knew she'd had depression. They knew she had ADD. They knew the medication she was on. They've known this for years. That police report was filed because the Myers damaged that family's property. But it's a report the prosecutor never saw. Me, personally, I've never seen anything on this case. He wants to see all the evidence now. From what he's heard, though, he knows hearts are broken. He doesn't think laws were. It's just a system that that isn't regulated much, and it's difficult to regulate it. It's just so easy to just type something out, send it out there, and not know what the consequence of that message is going to be. And can we police the entire thing? I don't know. So what about MySpace? Could, could the website bear any responsibility? Well, a couple of different law school professors say the answer is no. They say that technology long ago passed up the Constitution, and they say when it comes to the Internet, the laws are simply a mess. That's why Megan's family wants a new law. Live in St. Charles, Teresa Woodard, Fox 2 News. Well, plenty of viewers have sounded off on this story, and so can you. Just head over to myfoxstl.com and go to our news blog. This morning, a cautionary tale for parents out there. A 13-year-old girl found herself in the middle of a cruel cyber hoax, and her parents say it led to their daughter's suicide. Now, more than a year after Megan Meyer's death, her parents are pushing for measures to protect other children. At 13 years old, Megan Meyer was like many teenagers. She struggled with low self-esteem, but her family says she was looking forward to getting her braces off, enjoying life in the suburbs of St. Louis, and excited about a new friend she met through the social networking site MySpace.com. She got this email from this boy named Josh Evans. 
Josh claimed to be a 16-year-old boy who lived nearby and was homeschooled, but the relationship would quickly turn hurtful as conversation turned to insult. Megan gets an email or a message on her MySpace from Josh saying that I don't know if I want to be friends with you any longer because I hear you're not nice to your friends. Megan was devastated. The next day, after more exchanges, her mother found her in her bedroom closet. She had hanged herself. Weeks later, her parents learned that Josh never existed. He was created by the mother of one of Megan's former friends down the street. That's the biggest tra tragedy of the whole thing. An adult did it. It's a bizarre twist to the very common world of cyberbullying. Nearly half of teenagers report they've been the victim of cyber attacks, from text messaging to emailing, even websites dedicated solely to harassment. When emotionally vulnerable young people get online, they can be very easily manipulated. Megan's parents don't believe her tormentors meant for her to commit suicide, but they say the harassment drove her to the edge. And joining us now are Megan's parents, Tina Meyer and Ron Meyer. Good morning to you. First of all, our condolences, obviously, for the loss of your daughter. I know it's difficult to talk about all this. We hear about kids cyberbullying, bullying each other online, but this was a parent bullying your daughter, pretending to be someone else? Why would she do that? We don't know. I. How do you get in the mind of somebody that you just have no idea we have no answer for that do you think her daughter put her Why? up to it and wanted to know more about your daughter or? no um, everything that we found out so far it was uh this the sole idea of the mother do you hold her responsible for the death of your daughter absolutely yes i believe they were the ones that uh took her to the edge of the cliff and uh, gave her the nudge to go over. Did you have any idea uh, at any point, Tina, that this was not a 16-year-old boy named Josh that your daughter was conversing with? Any red flags? Um, there were red flags, um, but they weren't big enough. There were enough red flags where I did make a call to the local police department to find out how can you find if a MySpace account is real or not. There's no real way. Um, you know, I certainly had that gut feeling, mm -hmm. um, but it wasn't, again, it wasn't enough to, it was just that nervous mom and, feeling. And, and as you say, um, there's, there was, yeah, as you say, there's no way to prove this. So I wonder, what do you, what do you think can be no. done to stop this from happening again to, to someone else? Is there any way to stop someone from, from, prof from putting a profile up that's fake? I wish there were regulations with these these companies that are out there that put out these these type of forums. Um, th there's got to be something. I mean, children are able to, no matter whether they're eight, nine, ten, they're adults. They can get on there and put. They they can be whoever they want to be. Um, and there needs to be some sort of regulations mm -hmm. out there to be able to protect children. Uh, parents can only be in so many places at so many times. Um, and children do not understand the risks. Ron, is so there a, I, sorry, we're running out of time. I'm sorry. sorry. Ron, is there a quick lesson, though, for other parents? Um, I'd just like to say is uh, don't take anything for granted and uh, is, uh, be as watchful as you can be and uh, proactive in the involvement with your children on the Internet. Right. Well, good luck in your fight to make some changes. Tina Meyer, Ron Meyer, we thank you for your time. NBC News in depth tonight, an internet hoax and its terrible consequences. The parents of a teenage girl who took her own life in a St. Louis suburb are now going public with her story as a cautionary tale for other parents. Here's NBC's George Lewis. Megan had asked if she could have a MySpace um, for her 14th birthday. When Megan Meyer joined the 70 million users of the popular online hangout, MySpace.com, her parents said they took precautions, insisting that Megan only use the computer under their supervision. We were protecting her as much as possible. There was nothing that could have harmed her, is what we felt. Then, Megan, who had struggled with weight problems and depression, met someone online. He said his name was Josh Evans. He was 16 and attracted to her. To her, it was like, whoa, you know, had never experienced this. But a year ago, Josh abruptly turned on Megan 
Megan received an email from Josh stating, I don't know if I want to be friends with you any longer because I heard you're not a very nice friend. Then, Megan began receiving insulting messages from other people. Bulletins went out calling her name, saying Megan's fat. She just said, everybody's being mean to me. I don't understand it, why they're saying these horrible things about me. I just told her, it'll be okay, Meg. But it wasn't okay. 20 minutes later in Megan's bedroom, Tina screamed when she discovered her daughter had hung herself. I just dropped what I was doing and ran up there as fast as I could, and, uh, and that's when she was uh, hung, hanged in the uh, closet. Some months later, another shock. The Myers discovered there was no boy named Josh, that it was all a hoax. A neighbor tipped them that the whole thing was cooked up by the parents of one of Megan's former girlfriends. The idea to see if Megan was saying nasty things about their daughter online. I feel that they were, they led to her taking her life. Despicable, um, disgusting. There's not enough uh, horrible words to describe it. The family that invented Josh lives just down the street from the Myers. There's a question whether they broke a new federal law prohibiting internet harassment. This was done just to hurt a child. And when adults act like children, we need to treat them like criminals. Now, Megan's mom and dad hope to warn other parents so that they don't have to go through the same heartbreaking experience. George Lewis, NBC News, Los Angeles. Tina and Ron Meyer are Megan's parents. Mr. and Mrs. Meyer, good morning to both of you and our condolences to you. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, it, it's been almost a year since, since Megan's death and now you're coming forward to speak out about this. Why come forward now? Well, we had had, after Megan had passed away, it was about five weeks until we found out that it was not just the boy, it was af actually a family. Um, we had hired attorneys, and then the attorneys had suggested that we keep it quiet. Um, the FBI did an investigation, and they suggested we keep it quiet also. During that investigation, obviously, we were hopeful that something was going to be done criminally. And that took a while. Um, once everything was exhausted on that side, and they came to us and said, listen, there's nothing that we can do. It doesn't fit into any law. We just were devastated. And from that point, just kind of needed to take a little bit of a break. I'll go back into some of the um, details in a second, Mr. Meyer, but does it seem as if you've exhausted any legal remedy for this? I mean, we, we heard about a, possibly a new federal law that covers harassment online. Is this situation, does this not fall under that law? Um, we're hopeful for that. Um, we, we're still continuing on with the fight on the criminal and on the civil side um, as of right now as we speak. You, you two are parents who, as we heard in the piece, did from time to time monitor Megan's communications online. So can you explain to other parents who are watching how this might have, have gotten out of hand, how this may have developed so quickly? Well, it wasn't even time to time. I mean, it was monitored highly. Um, it was, Megan was not allowed to get online. We had the password. Megan couldn't even sign on without us. We had to be in the room. So this was highly monitored. The only thing that we can suggest is that parents just take a, a closer look at what their kids are doing. And take, a, you know, kids take a step and look at what they're doing also. I mean, it is very scary. I well, mean, you're, you're, we were fighting against adults. <laughs> well, Mrs. Meyer, let me go back to that. If you, you were monitoring her communications then, as you say, on a daily basis, what were you saying to her when she first started to communicate with this young man, Josh, that she thought was just a nice guy expressing interest in her? Did you warn her about getting her hopes up or that she might be let down by this young man she'd never met? Oh, absolutely. I mean, that was always the talk of, you know, Megan, come on, we don't even know this person, you know, let's not get too excited. And she would say, oh, mom, you don't understand, you know. And, you know, so I did talk to her daily about that. And, and but, again, children at this age, they, that's, they don't think that. And, and there's something, Mr. Meyer, that, that somewhat haunts me as I read the script here and read the information, that, that when it comes right down to it, Megan died never knowing that this young man didn't exist absolutely um, yes 
she uh, she she still believes that it's uh, it was Josh Evans. I mean, as we said, we didn't find that out till about six weeks later that it was the parents down the street from our house. So what would you say? What and would she you? Would well, for, for two questions real quickly. Have you had any contact, any conversations with the, with the parents, the neighbors who were behind this? What have they said? Have they offered apologies? Anything like that? Um, they've absolutely offered no apologies. They've uh, basically they've sent us a letter in the, ma in the mail basically saying that they might feel a little bit of responsibility, but uh, they don't feel no guilt or remorse or anything for what they did. And Mrs. Meyer, what, what? I ran into her. Go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead. I ran into her this past week um, after the story ran in the local paper, and she asked me to stop doing all of this. And I told her that we would not stop, that we were going to continue for justice for Megan because they knew what they did. So is there, is there one piece of advice you can offer to other parents? I feel to continue to monitor your children, take that extra step, ask the questions, look at their computers, see what they're doing, and for kids to please take those extra steps and don't trust anybody online that you do not know is your true friend. Tina and Ron Meyer. Mr. and Mrs. Meyer, again, our condolences, and we thank you for sharing your story and Megan's story with us this morning. Thank, thank you. you. Time now for Big Justice, and a mother and father are trying to seek justice for their young daughter's suicide. Fox News has been following the story of a 13-year-old who hanged herself in her closet after she was seduced and then rejected by a fictitious 16-year-old boy online. The distraught teen died without ever knowing that the boy who she thought rejected her was really a family down the street playing a twisted and cruel hoax on her. And now her distraught parents are trying to get the family to pay, stepping up their efforts today to get lawmakers to pay attention to their case. Big Story correspondent Douglas Kennedy spoke to the little girl, Megan's mother, today. He's with us now, Douglas. Yeah, John and Heather. Tina Myers says she tried to keep her daughter off the Internet because she says you never know who you're talking to and what their motives are. Now she fears even if you do know, there may be nothing you can do about it. When their daughter died, Ron and Tina Meyer turned to everyone they could think of for justice. We went to the local authorities, the St. Charles County Police Department, the prosecutor, um, the FBI got involved. But it's been a year since their 13-year-old hung herself and no one has taken action. Tina Mayer says she's now considering a civil suit. What would be the basis of the civil suit? Obviously for all the damages that had been done to our family, um, to our daughter, to every single thing that had been done. The Myers say Megan was the victim of a cruel online hoax perpetrated by the parents of Megan's former friend, a neighbor who lives just up the street in Darden Prairie, Missouri. She got this email from this boy named Josh Evans. In fact, in the month before she died, Megan had been involved in an intense online romance with Josh Evans. Only Evans was a fiction, made up by the neighbors who, according to a police report, wanted revenge on Megan for talking trash about their daughter at school. Megan's mother says 20 minutes before Megan killed herself, the neighbors once again pretended to be Josh, this time sending Megan into a suicidal spiral. Megan gets an email or a message on her MySpace from Josh saying, that I don't know if I want to be friends with you any longer because I hear you're not nice to your friends. She did do what she did, but she had help to push her to do that, which is indescribable to me. The problem for the Myers is that laws regarding online harassment are few and far between. Tina says she's hoping a new law regarding internet stalking may help them. Annoying people anonymously over the internet is now a federal crime. In 2006, President Bush signed the Violence Against Women Act of 2005. According to a section of the act, anyone who uses the internet anonymously with intent to annoy, abuse, threaten, or harass another person can be tried for violating the federal telecommunications law and faces fines or jail. And this is something that we're hoping that will be able to be placed against the people because it was put into effect prior to my daughter taking her own life.
Meyer says she has forwarded a copy of the law to a local prosecutor. She says she also plans to forward it to the FBI by tomorrow morning. She says if no one thinks the law applies to her case, John and Heather, she is going to work to change that law. Hey, Douglas, the parents who did this said a word? They have said nothing, uh, except to the police who they admitted that uh, they, they were trying to yeah, harass her. And, and they say their, their reason for doing this, and we'll bring in Joe in just a second, but their reason for doing this was A, to find out what their daughter, what this girl was they writing have about. They have a 13-year-old daughter, and they were friends at one but point. But they also really wanted to mess with her. They really wanted to hurt this little girl. The, this is the classic overprotective 2007 parents who just go way too far. No, no, there's no disputing that injustice was done to this beautiful little girl, but did the family who bullied her online actually commit a crime? Maybe not in the eyes of the law, but as Douglas just said, her family may try to get the laws changed. People bully and prank each other all the time, but should they be held legally responsible if the prank pushes someone to suicide? What about when the victim is a child and the victimizer is an adult, like in this case? Douglas is going to stay with us, but let's bring in our legal guest, criminal defense attorney, Joe Tacopino. Okay, so the perpetrator here is the adult. What, what recourse do the parents of this young deceased girl have? You know, putting pressure on prosecutors certainly is one uh, raising the, the public awareness of, of things like this. I mean, this is vile. There's no if, ands, or buts about it. The parents who did this are not the classic protective. I have five kids is at, you know, that you couldn't catch me in a million years thinking about spending time to torture another kid. I pick up the phone, maybe speak to the parent. But this is vile. What they did here, it, but on, on the other hand, um, does it rise to the level of criminality? Uh, is there even a, an actionable civil claim? Probably not, because there is something that us lawyers get bogged down with called uh, uh, causation. Before you go to causation, mm -hmm. I mean, these online, this online fraud leads to a suicide. W why shouldn't people look at it as a murder? Well, if it leads to a suicide. I mean, again, I can't say, you can't ask me that question and say, before we go to causation, let's ask the question. Well, but that is causation. But I mean, Doug, how do you know about it the leads causation. to the murder? I mean, this girl was, don't forget, she had bouts of depression prior to any of this going on. She had attention deficit disorder, uh, weight problems that apparently okay. caused her to be depressed. You're a lawyer, you're a parent, let's just say this happened to you. What would you be doing? Oh, everything that these parents are doing, probably more, uh, going out there, uh, seeking, seeking every ounce of justice I could get. You know, she's not going to have very much luck with the local sheriff's office. No. He says there's no law that applies to it. Where she may have some luck is with the feds. I spoke with the U.S. attorney in Washington State who says she prosecuted a case very similar to this in 2003 where an ex-boyfriend was harassing his ex-girlfriend and, and sending uh, false emails to her work and so on and so Guys, forth. And he, he, he went what, to jail. What stuns me is that the law enforcement doesn't know about this and she's got to bring in the feds. Anyway, guys, we'll, we'll stay on this. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. After an exhaustive investigation, it has now been announced there will be no charges filed in the Megan Meyer case. In a news conference that just wrapped up, St. Charles County Prosecutor Jack Bannis says what happened in this case did not violate any law that prosecutors can prove. Fox News' Sean Lindsay is live in St. Charles with the details. Sean? Good morning, April and Kevin. This is a tragedy. There is no question about that. But the prosecutor says that what happened in the days before Megan Meyer killed herself involved in number of conversations online between teenage girls and those girls never imagined that this would happen, that she would kill herself. Banna says the intent of creating the fake MySpace account was to find out what Megan was saying about a friend. Banna says the mother of that friend, Mrs. Drew, knew about the account and knew about Megan's fragile mental state, but her role in many of the communications is disputed, including the final communication that said the world would be a lot better without Megan. That came from an 18-year-old employee of Mrs. Drews, who is now hospitalized for psychiatric problems. She herself may be suicidal as a result of her involvement in this terrible tragedy. Megan Meyer killed herself after reading the message that she believed came from Josh. Josh never existed, but Megan believed he was her friend. Vanna says this case does not meet Missouri's harassment, stalking, or child endangerment laws. He says the purpose of the MySpace account was not to disturb or frighten Megan, which is necessary to prove under Missouri law. Their purpose was never to cause her emotional harassment. It's that we can prove. There's a difference between what people think or what we may believe the reason was that they created this. It's what we can prove. 
Now, Banna says that there has been plenty of retaliation against the family involved with the creation of that MySpace account. Ironically, much of what has happened to them may actually be prosecutable as harassment. He says that there have been uh, things that have been said and done online. Their house has been hit with paintballs. Windows have been broken and charges will be filed in at least one instance. Because we can't prosecute somebody, it certainly doesn't justify violating the law. We live in this country by the rule of law. We have to. Otherwise, we lose our civility. Now, Banna says there are certainly some loopholes in state laws that he believes need to be addressed. But this case involved so many people, so much he said, she said, that even if there were an Internet harassment law, harassment law in place, he doesn't necessarily know if uh, this case could be prosecutable under that law. He does want the state to go ahead and look into those things. But again, the circumstances of this case uh, just so b bizarre and involving so many people, all of which very difficult to prove under the law. Live in St. Charles, I'm Sean Lindsay, Fox 2 News. No charges will be filed in the case of a young girl who killed herself after being harassed online. The St. Charles County prosecutor in Missouri had been investigating whether any laws were broken when cyberbullying apparently led to the suicide of 13-year-old Megan Meyer. The teen thought she was falling for a 16-year-old boy online. Instead, he was apparently made up by another 13-year-old girl, her mother, and an older teen. Joining us now, MSNBC senior legal analyst and former Connecticut state prosecutor Susan Filan. Do you think the prosecutor had anywhere else to go with this? I think he sounded like such a conscientious, responsible person that if he did, he would have. But I think he felt that his hands were tied. It's just counterintuitive to me, though, that an adult can engage in this kind of behavior that leads to the suicide of a young girl and not be held accountable. It seems to me that either there are laws on the books that could have applied or there have to be. We've got to enact some. Yeah, well, let's talk about there, there should be something on the books. I mean, is there something you can think of or you can see that, that might have been applicable? Harassment, stalking, criminal uh, impersonation, reckless endangerment. I mean, it just seems to me that perhaps the prosecutor didn't want to take that cyber leap in the courtroom and try to convince a jury that what could have been innocent, in other words, making up a personality, posing as somebody else, pretending to court them and then be mean to them, isn't normally criminal behavior. But there are other aspects to this case, which is simply that it's a mom, it's a grown-up, it's an adult who could have and should have known the consequences of her behavior. The mom apparently knew that this young girl was taking certain kinds of prescription medicines, which would, I think, suggest some kind of vulnerability that perhaps isn't in any other teen. I just can't see how she gets away with it. And let me ask you finally, do you, I mean, we've talked about this before, how sometimes, especially with new technology, it takes a tragedy for new laws to be enacted. Do you think that other localities, perhaps even states, will do what her town did, which is at least make this a misdemeanor in some way, directly prosecutable? I think so. The trick, though, is to make sure that it doesn't violate the First Amendment free speech, that it isn't overly vague so that it's unconstitutional, unenforceable, and so that it isn't basically legislating a, a law that says it's not okay to be mean. It's illegal to be mean. We can't regulate conduct, although it would be nice if we could. It's got to be something more than that. It's got to be something that you do something like this, someone dies, you're responsible. Okay, Susan, thanks. You bet. Tina, when you heard no one would be charged in connection with your daughter's suicide, how did you feel? Well, I was certainly disappointed and you know, I was angered at first. I was, you know, when he first told me um, on Friday afternoon, we'd had about a three-hour meeting. And in the beginning, you know, I, I just certainly couldn't understand it. And we went through line by line the statutes and the three different areas of where he thought possibly could have been some criminal prosecution. When we went through that, it certainly... But while I wasn't happy about it, it made sense where he was not going to be able to prosecute based upon the statutes that were available. I know there is actually a new law in your community which, which makes this kind of bullying a misdemeanor. Uh, is that enough for you at this point? Is that justice for your daughter? Absolutely not. It is certainly, you know, we were absolutely thrilled that there was such quick action with the mayor. 
um, in our city because it, it certainly just gave us that extra step that somebody at least listened to us. But it, it is absolutely not enough, not even close. Um, and the mayor also agreed with that, too. We are absolutely 100% moving forward with getting laws and laws that are not going to have the cracks because that's the problem is when you go line for line with these statutes mm-hmm. if there's you know everything is with the intent well because the original intent of this myspace was stated that the intent was to find out if my daughter was speaking about her daughter mm-hmm. well that throws out that part of it so it's very very specific yeah. and we have to make sure with lawmakers that we, with now the Internet being so, you know, growing so fast, and this is not going to be something that's going to just die down. This is something that is going to be forever growing. And then that and is why it's so important uh, to raise awareness about it. We're getting a little short on time, but I'm curious, uh, this other family, the other mother, uh, you all still live in the same community. Has she apologized to you? No, she hasn't, and really it's not something that I even want from her. Um, not Do you ever see her, me. even at the grocery store? I had seen her about two weeks ago, right after the story broke, and she asked me to just stop all of this, and I told her that we would never stop, that we will continue on every day. And a, an apology from her really means absolutely nothing to me. Uh, is there anything that, that ever would make you feel as if justice had been served for Megan? You know, I really, even with today, you know, decision, I do not feel that was a defeat at all. You know, Megan is with us every single day and certainly carries me every day. This only gives me more power to be able to stand up and say, you know what, laws absolutely 100% need to be changed. And this is also giving me the power to be able to get into the schools with children, giving them education on cyberbullying. And, you know, again, it's not a defeat. This is just one more step that gives me, you know, the, the, where I need to go mm-hmm. in order to continue Megan's fight. Tina Meyer, I wish you the best of luck with that. Thanks for your time. Thank you. That is Megan Meyer, who at 13 years old killed herself after someone she met on her MySpace page turned against her. Megan thought she was talking to a 16-year-old boy, a boy who liked her. As we know, the boy never existed. He was created by a neighbor, a woman, a mother, who wanted to find out why Megan and her daughter were fighting. Tina Meyer is the mother of Megan. She joins me now from St. Louis. Tina, I'm so sorry for your loss. What Thank you. What went through your mind when you heard the prosecutor say there would be no criminal charges filed? Well, I met with him on Friday, and we went over this for three hours. And, you know, when I first spoke with him, I was extremely angry and disappointed. And I certainly couldn't understand why, why there could not be criminal charges when I felt that what she had done was absolutely criminal. And once we went through the statutes line by line and what he had to work with, unfortunately, again, there just is not, the law just does not work with what has happened. When you look at the intent and when you look at what he has to work with, unfortunately, it's not there. Uh, but, I'm sorry. And now there seems to be some, I mean, th- this mother uh, uh, who, I mean, what is going through her mind or what was going through her mind, I, I can't even begin to understand, but she apparently hired somebody, an 18-year-old girl, to set up this page, and I guess her own daughter contributed to this page as well. Who do you hold responsible? I absolutely hold the mother responsible and the father. The father knew what was going on also. And, you know, in the beginning, we've always known that the mother probably was not the one who actually typed the MySpace. She had no idea how to do this. And so we've always known that it was probably the 18-year-old employee and the 13-year-old daughter who physically typed it. And she was probably the one who sat there and, you know, knew what was going on. Bottom line is, she was the adult. She knew my daughter and had known us for years, knew that she was on medication. If you're an adult and you're allowing this to go on, she stated that she also stood behind her daughter when she typed messages to my daughter. If you're going to allow that to go on, you absolutely should be charged with criminal charges. We can't know what the outcome of things are. To say that she did not intentionally 
think that my daughter was going to commit suicide. I agree with that. I don't think that they went into this deciding, you know what, your daughter's going to commit suicide and that's what we want to do. I think that they intentionally made this MySpace account. I think that it was one of those things. She wanted to see if my daughter was talking about her daughter. But you're playing with the child. It's, it's completely reckless. I mean, there's no, there's, there's no doubt about it. Wh Absolutely. What, what do you... I mean, where do you go now? I mean, there, do, do, you, do, you, do, you, do you try to go after them civilly? What, what, what is the next step? Well, we certainly haven't closed any doors um, as far as a civil suit. But, you know, my biggest thing is, regardless, I don't feel this is a defeat. To me, um, it is one step further that we're going to go. We have to work with lawmakers. And the Internet has moved so quickly, and the laws have not. We have got to work with lawmakers to get the laws in place to work with what the internet has. This is not going to be anything that's going to stop anytime soon. And you want schools to address this issue too? Oh, absolutely. We've got to get into the schools. We've got to address cyberbullying with the children, with parents, with educators. Do people we take bullying seriously enough, especially cyberbullying? Oh, absolutely not. The children are cyberbullied all day long. It's not just in school where we used to get bullied. Now it's in school, you go home, you get cyberbullied there, and it goes out to hundreds and hundreds of kids. And children, there's no stopping point. So we have to address it absolutely. Tomorrow, in a decision not to file criminal charges in that case of the internet hoax that led to a young girl's suicide. NBC's Peter Alexander has the details. As cruel as the online messages 13-year-old Megan Meyer received may have been, as painful the terrible result, the county prosecutor says there's no evidence of child endangerment, stalking, or any other crime. Earlier this morning, Prosecutor Jack Bannis spoke to the Today Show. That still would not amount to harassment through stalking because it's only one conversation, only one course of conduct, and our law requires that it be repeated, meaning more than once. Megan's parents say they're disappointed, but not surprised. If you have to go by the law, which is what the court system does, there's, your hands are tied. The sad story began last year when Megan, who had a history of depression, was ecstatic to meet 16-year-old Josh Evans on MySpace.com, never knowing he wasn't real. Prosecutors say the fake MySpace page was created by an 18-year-old woman who worked for one of the buyer's neighbors, Lori Drew. The sole purpose, not to bully Megan, but to find out what she'd been saying about Drew's 13-year-old daughter. At best, prosecutors say Drew knew about the page. At worst, she instigated it and told her daughter what to write. And the sole purpose by all parties that were involved in this has been to find out what Megan was saying about this 13-year-old daughter of Mrs. Drew. Josh first showered Megan with compliments. Then a few weeks later, began posting insults about her online. It's unclear exactly who wrote what. The final note read, this world would be a better place without you. A short time later, Megan hanged herself. Despite all the outrage, criminal law attorneys say the prosecutor had no choice. This is still relatively new technology, and it takes a while for the law to catch up with technology. Lori Drew's teenage employee has been hospitalized for psychiatric care. The Drew family is now the target of harassing calls and sinister threats. A poorly conceived hoax blamed for one teenage girl's death and for dividing an entire small town community. For today, Peter Alexander, NBC News, Los Angeles. We have reaction from both sides this morning. Megan's parents, Tina and Ron Meyer, in O'Fallon, Missouri this morning. We'll speak to them in a moment. But first, a Today exclusive, Jim Briscoe, Lori Drew's attorney, is with us. This is the first time anyone has spoken publicly on Mrs. Drew's behalf. Jim, good morning. Nice to have you here. Thanks for Her having reaction me. to the fact the DA is not going to press charges? Well, certainly she is, she's happy with that decision, and, and we were confident that was going to be the case all along once the facts came out and once the, the prosecutor had a chance to look at all the facts. So much has been said and written about Lori Drew over the course of the last month or so. Why hasn't she come forward to tell her side of the story? Well, there was an investigation going on, and she did not want to, to interfere with that investigation. We were in contact at times with the prosecutors and and they were asking her questions she cooperated fully um, and she told them what she knew about the case and wanted to give them a chance to, to talk to all the witnesses. You've heard what's been said that either she instigated this hoax, that she created this hoax, that she carried out this hoax, that she wrote the negative messages, she created Josh. What exactly was her role in this? Well, 
I certainly have heard all those things. And she did not create the MySpace account. She did not instruct anybody to create the MySpace account. The She never um, made any communications through the MySpace account. What was her role then? She, these teenage girls that, and I, I it's, it's a little hard to explain without giving names, but we, we I'm absolutely not going to give names of these teenage girls, and she, my client does not want me to do that, and that's been part of the problem. She doesn't want to put th those names out in the public and uh, to have them have the same same things happen to them that's been happening to her. Was she in favor of this sting operation taking she, place? She, she knew these girls were doing it, and she didn't stop it. She wished she did. If she could turn back the clock, that's the part that she would do differently. Did she know at the time that Megan Meyer was being treated for ADD and she had a history of bipolar? condition she, she wasn't sure about she knew the ADD the other stuff she wasn't sure she thought maybe there was some condition that was like similar to that but she because didn't know that's the, the question people ask if she had that information how could she have let this go on well first of all everything as far as Ms. Drew knew was that all the communication was nice and polite and there was there was no harassing going on in fact through there's it's undisputed that there were no negative mean comments no cyber bullying at all until the last 24 hours before um, Megan took her own life and that time when those messages happened Mrs. Drew was not in the residence she did not know these things were happening she didn't find out that these negative comments happened until after so you're willing to state unequivocally she had absolutely nothing to do with the negative nasty comments that were posted online about Megan Meyer absolutely hundred percent there's no doubt and when she found out about it when she found she didn't find out about it until after um, till after Megan had taken her own life. What, what to what extent has the harassment now been targeting the Drews? Um, well, um, Mrs. Drew has had to close her advertising business because people have been attacking her advertisers, and they want nothing to do with it. They don't want the bad publicity. Um, her friends and neighbors are afraid to talk to her because they're afraid they're going to be attacked next. Her daughter has had to drop out of school because of the the harassment. So she's she's not in school. They don't know what they're going to do as far as getting her into school. Right now they let her take classes that do work outside of the class, but that can't go on forever. Um, living in the neighborhoods uh, is it may be impossible in the future. I mean, she doesn't know how she's going to handle that. It's not, as you, you know, people know it's not so easy just to move, and, and that's, uh, it, it's a very terrible situation. Mr. Briscoe, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dominica. Well, Waterford Crystal Drive is one of those quiet Midwest streets that seems to be the perfect place to live. But the suicide of teenage girl Megan Myers and allegations that she had been tormented by a neighbor, Lori Drew, over the Internet, have people there up in arms. Neighbors now want the Drew family to move out of the area as soon as possible. Megan's mom, Tina Meyer, was on the live desk recently and said that she feels no remorse for how neighbors are treating the Drews. It is an adult who did this. And now the public is saying, we're not going to stand for this. So do I feel sorry for her? No. Mm -hmm. Do I want any harm coming to her children? Absolutely not. All right, joining me now by phone is Christine Buckles, the next door neighbor of Lori Drew and good friend of Tina's. Christine, thanks for being here. What are people in your community saying about the Drew family? Well, everyone in our community wants them out. They feel that they do not belong in our community after what they've done. We just want them gone. Do you think that this is vigilante justice? Are you doing things to this family to coerce them or urge them to leave the neighborhood? No, no. Um, actually, we just kind of ignore them. Since the stories broke, we have not seen much of them at all, which is actually very nice to us. But we just want them gone. We don't want to have to deal with them. We don't want to look at them every day. Well, we've actually heard that there's more than just ignoring going on and that there is actually sort of a nasty website that has been created targeting Lori Drew, the mother. Do you know anything about this? I don't. When you do see your neighbor, I mean, this is your neighbor after all, if you cross paths as you're going to the grocery store or as your kids are going to school, what's that exchange like? Actually, Lori Drew will not look at me. She will not look me in the face. What about all the kids in the neighborhood? How are they treating the Drew children? Um, none of them, the Drew children really haven't been seen since the story broke either. Um, so there's not been a whole lot of communication with the Drews and anyone since the story broke.
if you want them to leave the neighborhood and that's your ultimate goal, how will you begin exerting pressure for them to do that? I don't believe we can. I think that's something that they have to feel that they need to leave. I mean, I don't think that as a neighbor there's any way I can force someone out of a neighborhood other than to voice my opinion, which is exactly what I'm doing. I have no qualms about saying that I, and I know that I speak for several of the other residents in our neighborhood, want them out. But that's about all we can do. Right. All right. Christine Buckles, thank you so much for joining us with your candid opinion this morning. Let's see what today's A-list has to say about this. Angela McGlowan is a Fox political analyst. Peter Johnson Jr. is a Fox News legal analyst. Lauren Lake is a criminal defense attorney. And today's Fox wildcard, Fox senior judicial analyst, Judge Andrew Napolitano. Thanks so much for being here, guys. Uh, I think that neighbors feel as though they need to take things into their own hands when they feel abandoned by the court system or by the, by the criminal justice system. And this mother and this family is never going to be charged even though this young girl is dead. Lauren, I want to go to you. You're, you're a criminal defense attorney. How would you advise this family that has basically been turned into a pariah in this neighborhood? What should they do? Um, move. Hello. You know, let's just get real here. This was a terrible, terrible occurrence, and this mother really, really misbehaved. Now, whether or not the courts decide to follow through or the criminal justice system decides to follow through, I would honestly advise them, you don't have to move, but why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you want a fresh start? Why would you sit here in this home and remind this family constantly that their d daughter is gone and there may be some small feeling that you may have something to do with it? You know, there's a category of, and I agree entirely with Lauren, there's a category of behavior, reprehensible but not remediable. That is, it's so wrong, but there's nothing the courts can do about it. Mm -hmm. and, and ostracizing people is a classic traditional way of community punishment mm -hmm. when the behavior hasn't risen to the level of a crime. Okay, so, but let's say it ends up going a little bit a notch above ostracizing Peter and they end up doing things like yeah. leaving nasty notes or yeah. they make prank calls or this uh, threatening internet uh, website. Then does it rise to the level of anything criminal? I mean, I can't believe this. This is a disturbing, dark, short story almost. Yeah, it can rise to the level of something criminal. And what I'm concerned about is, where are the local spiritual and political leaders bringing some sense of redemption or cohesion or clarity to this community? Should a tragedy beget another tragedy? Should another child die in that Drew household? Should this woman who may have committed these acts that may have, uh, according to some people, resulted in this child's suicide, should she be driven to suicide? Is that what we need? Is that what we want? Uh, but, yes. but forgiveness is hard, Angela. Forgiveness is hard, and I think that a lot of people are grieving here and they're lashing out, but having a loved one that did commit suicide, I want to say this, we're playing the blame game here, and committing suicide is just not one act that will cause you to do that. And I think that the parents of the young lady should take the responsibility because for someone to take their own life, they have to be really desperate. And this child could have been manic depressive. Oh, there obviously this child could have had problem. certain issues. There but obviously I, was a problem with yeah, the child. But right. the next door neighbor, the mother, but still, cannot judge, be allowed to get away with it. Right. It's but what are we going to do? Charge, I mean, them with man, charge her with manslaughter? Oh, no, no, no. I don't what think she committed a crime. That's why I said reprehensible, but, she, but not criminal. Right. And there's so much right. to debate here, obviously. Just move. Now, if not for her own sake or the sake of the child that died, for her own family's sake. Okay, Ailis, there's so much material here for us. An internet harassment case out of St. Charles County has been in the news lately. Good evening, everyone. I'm Jim Reed. And I'm Lauren Whitney in for Angie. 13-year-old Megan Meyer killed herself last year after receiving online harassment by someone she thought was a teenage boy. That boy turned out to be a mother of one of the girl's friends. Today, Megan Meyer's mother was in mid-Missouri to talk about online harassment. It's a new crime that lawmakers and law enforcement are scrambling to keep up with, and KOMU's Ashton Goodell shows us how Tina Meyer is battling cyber bullies. Tina Meyer says she has a mission to educate people about the dangers of cyberspace. An adult is not, you know, should not be allowed or able to hide behind a computer um, and harass a child. Meyer says her daughter's webpage on MySpace.com allowed cyber bullies to take advantage of Megan. She says online bullies are just as real and just as dangerous as school bullies. They're bullied about weight, bullied about, you know, just everything in general. I mean, everybody's been bullied, but Megan was certainly bullied about weight. She met with Governor Blunt's Internet Harassment Task Force today to encourage them to reconsider current stalking and soliciting statutes 
to protect children from online harassment. If it should happen again, be able to have laws in place that will keep families from having to go through what we went through. The best way to avoid harassment or unwanted solicitation is by one, monitoring your children's website and online chats, two, use website filters, and three, talk to your children about internet safety. Ashton Goodell, KOMU News, Jefferson City. The task force reviewed current statutes and compared internet laws from neighboring states. For more internet safety tips, you can go to our website at komu.com. Charges may be brought against a mother involved in an internet hoax that may have led to a 13-year-old girl, Megan Meyer, committing suicide. The Missouri teen was found hanging in her closet in October of 2006 after she allegedly received cruel messages on MySpace from a boy named Josh. One message read, the world would be better off without you. All of a sudden, my heart just dropped, and I just had this god-awful feeling. And I took off running upstairs and opened a door, and I saw her hanging in her closet. And I just screamed. Problem was, Josh wasn't real. The online profile was actually made up by a teenage employee of a woman living just doors down from Megan in suburban St. Louis. The neighbor apparently wanted to know what Megan thought about her own daughter. Missouri officials eventually decided not to press any charges because no laws appeared to apply in the case. The intention and the purpose of creating this and the purpose of the conversations that were going back and forth of trying to get this young girl to become her friend was so they could find out what Megan was saying about Mrs. Drew's daughter. But the Los Angeles Times reports federal prosecutors are considering bringing fraud charges against the woman, who denies creating the fake profile but admits to knowing about it. She also says she never sent or saw any of the cruel messages that Megan received. The Meyer family has been pushing for legal action all along. I mean, our hands were tied while our daughter was laying there taking her last breaths. Now we're having to stand here with our hands behind our back, knowing that these people are standing there saying, we didn't do anything wrong. The federal grand jury reportedly has issued subpoenas to MySpace. Prosecutors in Los Angeles believe they have jurisdiction because MySpace is based in Beverly Hills. Brian Thomas, the Associated Press. Well, Fox 2 has confirmed that a new federal investigation is underway tonight into whether criminal charges should be filed in the Megan Meyer MySpace suicide case. Well, this time, the inquiry is in California and reportedly focuses on possible federal charges involving one of the Meyer's Darden Prairie neighbors defrauding MySpace. Fox 2's Chris Renier has new details live now from St. Charles. Chris? Mandy, last month, the prosecuting attorney here, Jack Bannis, concluded no state criminal charges would be filed in the case, but now the U.S. attorney in L.A. is taking another look. 13-year-old Megan Meyer of Darden Prairie hanged herself in October of 2006 after she received mean messages on her MySpace account. She thought she was talking to a 16-year-old boy named Josh Evans, but the boy was fake. The account made up by people who knew Megan. The purpose? To see what Megan was saying about the daughter of one of her neighbors, Lori Drew who is seen here in a picture circulating in the media. Authorities say Drew knew about the fake account, but it's unclear whose idea it originally was to make it up. Now, the LA Times is reporting that the U.S. attorney in LA is investigating whether Drew defrauded MySpace by allegedly creating the false account. The paper says a grand jury has issued subpoenas to MySpace and other witnesses. Megan's father, Ron Meyer, hopes charges are filed. It definitely seems like a positive thing that uh, with MySpace involved, if it's a way to, to get them, the Drews, through fraud with MySpace, that's fine with me as long as they get charged something criminally. One of the Myers' neighbors who did not want to be identified told me today that she has received notification to go to California to meet with authorities about the case. Investigators are reportedly looking at wire fraud and cyber fraud statute. The investigation is being handled by the U.S. attorney in L.A. because MySpace is based in Beverly Hills. Lori Drew's attorney did not return my calls and nobody answered the door at their home this afternoon. Live in St. Charles, Chris Fernier, Fox 2 News. A federal grand jury has reportedly subpoenaed the website MySpace.com in an investigation into a deadly Internet hoax. According to the Los Angeles Times, prosecutors may take legal action against the Missouri mother who allegedly filed, or rather created, a false MySpace account to communicate with Megan Meyer. Officials say the 13-year-old girl committed suicide after receiving cruel messages from that account. 
Megan's mother says she is still in shock over the latest developments. Disbelief, truly, you know, because we've been through so many things, ups and downs, ups and downs, and it was kind of like, yeah, right. The attorney for the woman who allegedly created the account did not want to comment on what he calls rumors from an anonymous source. Prosecutors in Missouri did not file any charges because they say no laws had been broken. New developments tonight in the MySpace case that led to a local teenager's suicide. The LA Times reports that the U.S. Attorney's Office in LA may take legal action against the mother who was allegedly behind the deadly internet hoax involving Megan Meyer. News Channel 5's Jasmine Huda has more tonight. Jasmine? Mike and Deanne, the state of Missouri may not be able to prosecute the neighbor, but it may be a different story in California. According to a report by the LA Times, MySpace, which is located in California, is considering itself a victim of fraud. Right. Well, thank you. Tina Meyer dropped everything Tuesday to catch a flight to New York to appear on the Today Show. This after a surprise phone call. Almost disbelief. Truly, you know, because we've been through so many things, ups and downs, ups and downs, and it was kind of like, yeah, right. The LA Times reports a federal grand jury in Los Angeles has begun issuing subpoenas in the internet suicide case of Tina's daughter, 13-year-old Megan. More than a year ago, Megan hanged herself. Her parents say she was bullied by a neighborhood mother who they accused of posing as a teenage boy on MySpace.com. That mother says she knew about it, but that her daughter and an employee were behind the fake account. The L.A. Times is quoting sources in the U.S. Attorney's Office, saying they are, quote, exploring the possibility of charging the neighbor with defrauding MySpace by creating the false account that she, her daughter, and another person used to communicate with Megan, according to the sources, who insisted on anonymity because they are not authorized to speak publicly about the case. With details not out in the open, Meyer is still hopeful justice will be served for her daughter. Megan was absolutely the victim, but if in the end the outcome can still be the same, then I feel that, you know, either way, however it can be done, that's what we want done. The attorney representing the neighbor did not want to comment on what he calls a rumor from an anonymous source. We contacted the U.S. Attorney's Office in L.A. who refused to confirm the article in the Los Angeles Times. Again, Tina Meyer will appear on the day, Today Show tomorrow morning. Now to a new development in the case of the Missouri teenager who took her own life after she was harassed on the Internet. Her family wanted the mother allegedly behind the hoax to be prosecuted, but authorities hit a roadblock. But now there has been a surprising development. Here's NBC's Mike. The story of Megan Meyer created a nationwide furor. Just shy of her 14th birthday, she became a member of MySpace.com. Megan had a history of attention deficit disorder and depression, but she was elated when she met 16-year-old Josh Evans online, a handsome stranger who showered her with compliments. Telling her how beautiful her eyes were. But then, just as quickly, Josh ended the friendship, began posting insults about her online, and even told Megan the world would be a better place without her. The next day, Megan Meyer hanged herself in her bedroom closet. And then it turned out, all along, Josh Evans had been a hoax, fabricated, according to police reports, by Lori Drew, a grown woman who lived down the street. They wanted to find out online if Megan was talking about their daughter. The Myers waited for criminal charges to be filed against Drew, but local and federal prosecutors in Missouri could not find a statute that applied to the case. But now another possible twist. Sources tell the Los Angeles Times federal prosecutors here are considering charging Drew with defrauding MySpace, based here in California. The U.S. Attorney's Office declined NBC's request for comment. Since a homicide case really can't be brought, I doubt they'll get the type of sentence that will make people feel that there was justice. Levinson, a former federal prosecutor, also says the charge, if it's made, could raise questions about how to police the Internet fairly. One of the big problems for the prosecution here is that, boy, this is a very wide net. How many people actually do this on MySpace, set up accounts under someone else's name or pseudo-identities? I doubt she's the only person. All along, Drew, through her attorney, has denied wrongdoing. A federal wire fraud conviction carries a maximum 20-year prison sentence. For today, Michael Oku, NBC News, Los Angeles.
Tina Meyer is Megan's mother. Tina, good morning to you. Good morning. Where were you yesterday when you heard the news about pro prosecuting Lori Drew for defrauding MySpace? This idea of prosecuting her. Right. We were in the process of packing Megan's room. So it was... Kind you haven't of, touched the room since you lost her in 2006? No. Her room has stayed exactly the same, and we just finally started the process of packing up a room, which is just another part to me, which is kind of another chapter in ending, not ending her, but just another part, which is extremely hard. It was very, very difficult. So what was your reaction to this news, that they would prosecute Drew for defrauding MySpace? In other words, MySpace would really be the victim in this, right. not your daughter. Does that bother you? You know, Megan will always be the victim, so it, that does not change anything for me. If MySpace is considered the victim and any criminal charges can be brought against this family, the Drews, then so be it. And I will be thrilled because I still truly believe in my heart they absolutely should be criminally prosecuted. So if that's the way it needs to be in the end, then I say go for it. In the meantime, you've been working in your state to come up with laws to push for laws that would outlaw Internet bullying. Have you gotten anywhere with that at all? Well, they absolutely are working. Um, you know, Governor Blunt has a task force. I did go to the initial meeting, and I spoke at that task force. They had another meeting yesterday, and they are working towards getting laws changed. So that's a wonderful step forward. Um, I certainly am not going to stop. I want to make sure that it continues and moves forward. And it needs to be on a state level, not just individual municipal you know, misdemeanor laws. It needs to be on a state level so that it can be a bigger impact, not just a little slap on the hand. You know, in terms of prosecuting Drew, the U.S. Attorney's Office has not commented officially on this or said that, yes, this is definitely happening. But, but if, it, if it did happen to her, then some have said you'd have to prosecute a lot of people because a lot of people create these phony sites for very innocent reasons. So is it really right. fair? Well, you know what? Innocent reasons, I don't see any innocent reasons, and I think that what it would do is people would shut them down pretty quickly. And I think it would be a good statement for people to say, you know what, this is not okay. Making any type of a false MySpace account or Facebook account or any account is not okay. You're, you're still defrauding somebody, whether you're finding out if it's a cheating boyfriend, girlfriend, whether you're doing it as a joke to play with somebody. Any of those things to falsify it, you're doing it under, you're doing it in a way that's not truthful, and it doesn't need to be done. So you know, I think it needs to be. I think something needs to be done. Absolutely. The pain and the anger is still very much on the surface for you. Oh, absolutely. Do you still see Lori Drew in the community? Oh yeah, absolutely. I drove through the subdivision yesterday. She was waiting to pick her son up at the middle school. Do you ever have any conversations at all? No, none. None. None whatsoever. All right, Tina Meyer, thank you so much. Well, thank nice you. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Fox 2 News in the morning. Right now we have 26 degrees, but that will be changing, of course. A mother now on a mission after a MySpace prank was uh, followed by her 13-year-old daughter, and then she saw that and took her own life. Megan Meyer's death has now inspired a bill that would make Internet harassment a felony. And now declare bill number 07-134 has passed into ordinance number 1228. Yes. The laws began in Megan's hometown of Darden Prairie in St. Charles County. Other cities have now fall, falling, fallen in line. Now Tina Meyer takes her daughter's case to Jefferson City. Tina is here with us now. Good morning. Thank you very much for, coming, for coming in. in. Thank you. We've seen you around a lot. We've seen you on the national talk shows. You are really working hard to get the word out and, and folks are finally listening. Are you feeling that way? Definitely. I mean, you know, before I think that it's one of those things that takes a major tragedy to get people to listen. And unfortunately, harassment happens all of the time daily. But when it becomes an adult to a child harassment and then unfortunately she took her life, I think everybody took a stand and decided something has got to change. Now with the laws, at least we are making a change. I mean, I went and met up in Jefferson City with Senator Scott Rupp, and we went and talked to the Senate committee. We presented the bill that they have been working on, you know, Senate Bill 818, and they certainly want to work with it, which is an absolute positive thing. There are some things that they want to look at. Certainly they, you know, want to make sure that First Amendment rights are not 
going to be pushed too far, but there, everybody is taking charge, and that's a positive thing. Beyond the laws, I think what you've done, though, is you know people break laws all the time. You can create laws, people will break them. But what you've done by doing this is, is change some hearts. You know, People think about their actions. They think about what they're doing, cause and effect. Right. And are you seeing a, a result with that as well? Oh, absolutely. I mean, we have Megan's MySpace still open and a memorial page and the thousands of children and parents that send messages stating what a change it's made, that they're making changes in their own school, doing things in their own school. That's, that's the amazing change that I see and what to me makes it worth it every single day because if there's one child that can make a change and is going to do something, that's what's going to make the change. I believe it has opened up a dialogue amongst teenagers. Uh, I have a teenage daughter myself and I know this case affected her and how she kind of engages with her friends and, and on, on the internet as well. I do want to move on to the Megan Meyer Foundation, something mm -hmm. newly established. Can right. you tell us about that? Well, the Megan Meyer Foundation was something that I founded and it certainly is an honor of Megan. Um, and the entire mission is to bring awareness, education, and positive change to children, parents, and educators. You know, obviously to the bullying and the cyberbullying that's ongoing in our children's everyday environment. And what I want to do is obviously go to schools and speak to children, speak to parents and educators, and bring them the real life aspect of what goes on. They, they know what goes on, mm -hmm. but until they get the real life version of it, it doesn't impact them. Mm -hmm. um, they deal with this all of the time and when they see real life stories, that's what touches the children and that's what gets to them. Yeah, because so much of their world is virtual reality yeah. as it yeah. is. Right. Tina, thank you so much for coming in this morning. Right. Well, and thank you. We wanted to link you as well to the website in, in Megan's honor. It's at myfoxsdl.com. Just click on the morning show tab. If, if you think you maybe would like to have Tina. Guards now. More than a year after the suicide of Darden Prairie teenager, the state may be close to taking action against those who use the Internet as a weapon. A state task force finalized details on a proposal that could make it a felony if an adult harasses a child over the Internet or through other forms of media. Governor Matt Blunt organized the group last month after hearing about 13-year-old Megan Meyer. Her parents say she killed herself after receiving cruel messages online. Megan's mother testified before that task force about what her daughter went through leading up to her her death. Today, News Force Lisa Mondo spent some time with Tina Meyer. This is exactly how the room was when um, Megan committed suicide. It was in this closet where she hanged herself. Her family says an internet hoax on MySpace pushed their daughter Megan over the edge. Megan was not consistently harassed. That's another problem with her case. You know, she was groomed the entire time. It was a nice, sweet thing, and in the very end, Megan was bullied. It was a, a huge come down on Megan, where Megan couldn't take it. What was done to Megan may have broken the rules of right and wrong, but it didn't violate any state laws, something that outrages her mother, Tina. She sees that the governor's task force must weigh a person's right to free speech against protecting people from bullies. But as a mother who has lost a daughter to suicide, she's dedicated her life to making sure laws are passed to prosecute cyber bullies. I will absolutely not stop or be satisfied if laws do not change. Not any way, shape, or form. Will not stop. And we showed you a little bit of Megan's room as it was the day she died. Today, her mom and aunt cleaned out her room. We were shown some of Megan's favorite things. We have that video tour on our website. Just go to KMOV.com. Live in the Web Center, Lisa Monzo, News 4 St. Louis. Lisa, thank you very much. Just if you can just scan the room. Um, Did she put her name up on the wall? Yeah, they had their. That was there. This is this is exactly how the room was when um, Megan committed suicide. It's a closet she hung herself in. Um, there wasn't doors on there when she did that, and her dad put the doors back. But her room was exactly like this, maybe a little messier. Um, but nothing's been changed in her room since that since that day. Just getting close to Christmas? 
Um, it was actually October 16th. Um, that was a... And everybody, family and friends, put ornaments on it, and it stands out in front of the house at uh, Valentine's Day. So who has to take this room apart? Well, Tina and I are actually going to do that uh, today. Um, and Allison's supposedly moving into it, which we didn't think she would do, but she said she's going to, so I guess it makes it closer to her sister. This was our school quilt. Uh, they make a school post. Oh, quilt for the 8th grade class and uh, the woman that uh, when she won it at the raffle and heard about uh, Megan passing away, she gave it back to them. Hey, do me a favor. Oh, well, you guys can't go that way. I was going to use your, uh, oh. write your phone number down. Or... For the first time, we're going to hear from someone involved in the case, an exclusive interview with a young woman who says she created this page to trick a 13-year-old St. Louis girl who later killed herself. She and two others posed as a teenage boy and befriended the girl online and then sent a series of messages that may have pushed her over the edge, she fears. ABC's Deborah Roberts has more on all of this, Deborah. Diane, so many people have asked, where were the adults in this situation? Well, in an exclusive interview, the young woman who is at the center of all of this is speaking out for the first time and says there was an adult there. And worse, she was taking part. In the year and a half since Megan Meyer took her own life at age 13, her small, close-knit neighborhood still is struggling to heal. Just months ago, Megan's parents, Ron and Tina, could barely contain their pain. My life is nothing even remotely resembles what it was before. Lost the daughter, the family, just everything that was about us as a family as a whole no longer is. Never will be. 
Tina Meyer will never forget the anguish her impressionable daughter felt when a boy calling himself Josh Evans on the popular social networking site MySpace suddenly turned mean and insulting. Tina ordered Megan off the computer and her daughter stormed off to her room. I went upstairs and um, opened the door and saw her hanging in a closet and um, screamed and ran over and tried picking her up. Six weeks later, they learned there was no Josh Evans, that it was all a cruel hoax created in the home of neighbors Lori and Kurt Drew, whose 13-year-old daughter was unhappy with Megan. While authorities investigated, Lori Drew denied involvement, pointing the finger at this woman, 19-year-old Ashley Grills, as the mastermind of the fake account. But Grills, a longtime family friend of the Drews, insists that Lori was deeply involved in the deception. Who said, let's go online? Um, that was me and her daughter, and then she said, that sounds like a good idea. Lori Drew said that? Yes. So she was in from the beginning? Yes. No doubt in your mind? No doubt. And then you created the character? Yes. Ashley says she found a photo of a good-looking teenager and named him Josh Evans. Josh then contacted Megan. It was a prank, she says, to find out if Megan was gossiping about the Drew's daughter. What did you know about that friendship and whether there was any trouble between them? There was always trouble. They'd be friends one week and in an argument the next. The fake friendship went on for weeks with Josh flirting with Megan. And did everybody take turns writing at some point? Um, basically, yes. Lori, ever? A couple of times. So Lori actually sent messages as well? When we didn't know what to say. You're sure? I'm positive. Now, Lori Drew has said through her lawyer that she did not create or direct anyone to create the Josh Evans MySpace account, that it was really all your idea. True? Yeah, that's not true at all. Why would she say that? To cover her own self, I guess. So you go on and you're typing and you're going back and forth and it's fairly innocent. Then it starts to get nasty. Mm -hmm. Nasty messages. Yes. Then there's finally a really nasty message. Do you mm -hmm. remember it? Yes. What did it say? Our world would be a better place without you. Who wrote that? I did. I was trying to get her angry so she would leave him alone and I could get rid of the whole MySpace. So you yeah. wanted to end it? Yeah. By now, Ashley says she was feeling guilty about the trick. So this message is sent out and then something terrible happens in the Meyer household. Yes. What is going on there? My daughter just hung herself. It was October 16, 2006 when the Meyer's world was shattered. What did you think? What did you feel? I thought it was my fault. So what goes through your mind when you hear that a teenage girl that you all just played a joke on has committed suicide? A lot of things. Like it was my fault. <laughs> I shouldn't have said what I said. She says that Kurt Drew insisted that she quickly close down the MySpace account and that Lori instructed her to keep quiet. For a year, Megan's parents remained silent while Missouri officials investigated, but they soon went public with their story. A firestorm erupted with Ashley Grills right in the middle. Weeks ago, she testified before a grand jury in California, where MySpace is based. Criminal charges are being considered there. What kinds of things did you hear from people? They would tell me to kill myself and save everybody the trouble. People say they don't understand it. How could this have happened? Who could be so cruel? Who's to blame? I guess all of us. I mean, I'm partially to blame. They are partially to blame. What do you want people to know about you? That I'm not heartless. I do know what I did and I take responsibility for it every day. She is torn up over this situation. When contacting the Drews lawyers last night, they told us that they stand by the original statement that Lori Drew did not create or direct anyone to create the Josh Evans MySpace account. And though she was aware of it, that she never sent any messages, Diane. So, of course, it's a he said, she said, she said. But uh, 
a horrible situation that could now result in maybe criminal charges. It's just agony. This story, isn't it? And there's no going back. And this young girl says, you know, you have to be careful what you say online because someone could be hanging on to your every word. All right, thanks so much to you. In a flash, be the first to know what's coming up on Good Morning America tomorrow with the GMA Daily Flash email. All the great insider details you want to know from GMA. Go to abcnews.com, click the GMA page, and sign up for the Daily Flash. And you can even enter to win the weekly GMA Flash gift bag giveaway. Sign up now.